involved with this project, and she has supervised over 10 graduate students. So if you, okay, after, after a presentation, you can, you can tell them ab about your, your, the places you have. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the outline of my presentation. My presentation is mainly focused on the integration of wind, wind power. Okay? So the first, uh, the first topic that we are going to talk is the main wind energy conversion systems. We have four main wind energy conversion systems. We are discussing them a little bit. Then we are discussing about the connection of a wind power, a wind power plant to the grid. The most of the wind turbines today are connected to the grid in a wind uh, by a wind farm. Uh, then we are, dis discuss we are going to discuss the main grid codes for integration and operation of wind uh, generation. Basically, the main uh, grid codes today that are requiring a lot of attention of uh, who works with wind power are the fault right through requirements, the synthetic inertia, and reactive power control. So we are going to discuss these talks in my presentation. So the first type of uh, en uh, wind energy conversion system is the fixed speed. The fixed speed uses a conventional induction generator to convert the mechanical energy to electrical energy, as we can, as we can see here. It's a squirrel cage induction generator that is using. Uh, the rotor speed of a squirrel cage induction generator usually varies between 1 to 5 percent of the synchronous speed. And the synchronous speed depends on the number of poles of the electrical machine and the electrical frequency of the machine, as we can see here in this equation. So usually, the electrical machines, the squirrel cage induction machines, they have two to six poles. That results in a rotary speed of 3,600 to 1,200 RPM. So uh, we have to couple it, the generator to the wind turbine because the wind turbine presents a slower rotary speed. So the generator is coupled to the turbine through a gearbox to match the speed difference between the turbine and the generator. S and uh, also in this configuration, because the induction generator uses, consumes reactive power from the grid. So in order to improve the, react, uh, the power factor, uh, us usually we connect a capacitor bank here in the, uh, in the output of the wind generator, of the, sorry, the machine, the electrical machine. So let's talk a, a little bit about the efficiency of a fixed speed wind conversion system. As the name is a fixed speed, so the rotor speed varies, vary, uh, varies uh, just one to five percent of the synchronous speed, as we, uh, as I presented in the last slide. So the efficiency of a wind turbine depends on the tip speed ratio, as uh, we see in the, in the former presentation. So we can see here in this graph the power coefficient of a wind turbine as a function of the tip speed ratio. And the tip speed, speed ratio is the relation between the tip speed of the blade and the wind speed. So we can, by this expression, calculate it by this expression that depends on the angular speed of the rotor of the turbine and the radius of the wind, uh, the wind turbine divided by the wind speed. So as we can see here in this graph, uh, we can get the maximum efficiency of the wind turbine only for one specific value of the tip speed ratio. So when we are analyze the tip speed, the tip speed ratio uh, by the per the wind, uh, wind speed, we can see that the fixed speed wind conversion systems got, uh, operates at the maximum efficiency of the wind turbine 
only for one specific wind speed. Okay. So the advantage, the advantages of uh, fixed speed wind conversion systems is a low manufacturing and maintaining costs and reliable operation. And the drawbacks is that the system delivers the rated power at the grid only at one specific wind speed, as we could see in the last uh, slide. And the power delivered to the grid fluctuates with the wind speed. That's a, a big problem for power systems. So currently, they are not used in new wind power plants. Uh, they are more limited. The use of this uh, configuration is more limited to small or medium-sized wind turbines. The type 2 is a variable speed wind energy conversion system, but the variation of the speed is very limited. So it uses also our in induction generator, but is a wound rotor induction generator. That is a generator that we can access the rotor circuit. So in the rotor, rotor circuit, we are connecting a variable resistance. And by controlling this variable resistance, we can vary the rotor speed of the generator. And by varying the rotor speed of the generator, we can increase, increase the efficiency of the wind turbine. So the change in the rotor resistance affects the torque per speed characteristic of the generator. Uh, enabling variable speed operation of the turbine. And that's, uh, that is an advantage, as we could see before. But uh, we can, by this configuration, we can just increase the rotor speed. Uh, from the synchronous speed, we can just increase the rotor speed of the generator. The speed adjustment range is typically limited to about 10% of the synchronous generator. But even so, we can increase the uh, efficiency of the wind turbine. So the type 3 is a variable speed wind, turbine, uh, variable speed, uh, wind energy conversion system that uses a, uh, actually it is a doubly fed induction generator. This kind of configuration is very used today. The most of the manufacturers are employing this kind of this configuration. So in this configuration here, we also use an as asynchronous generator or induction generator. And is a wound rotor induction generator where we have access to the rotor circuit here. And instead of connecting a variable resistance as in the type two, uh, it is connected a, a power converter here. So it's a power converter actually that presents 25 to 30 percent of the generator capacity. So that is, a, that is an advantage of this configuration because we don't need a power converter with the same capacity of the generator. Usually, typically, uh, the, 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 the capacity of the converter is the 25 to 30 percent. So the converters allows be directional, uh, bidirectional power flow in the rotor circuit, and it increases the speed range of the generator. Actually, this configuration we can vary, we can vary the the rotor speed above 20 uh, percent uh, above the synchronous speed and 30 percent low the, the the synchronous speed. And another advantage of this configuration is that by controlling the rotor currents by the by the co electro, uh, the converters here we can also control the power factor of the generator so we can for example control the power factor to in the point of connection with the power grid to one that is a big advantage compared to type 1 and type 2 configurations so uh, let's take a look about the efficiency of this configuration the rotor speed, as I said before, the rotor speed is controlled to obtain the maximum turbine. We can control the rotor speed to obtain the maximum turbine efficiency, considering the possible rotor speed variation limits. So how we are going to control this? The minimum rot rotor speed 
is 70% of the synchronous speed. And the maximum is 20% above the synchronous speed, as we can see here. So between these values, we are going to control the rotor speed as a function of the wind speed. And the objective, uh, uh, the main goal of this is to, to, to obtain the, mac the optimum tip speed ratio uh, in these wind speeds, as we can see. So we are going to control the rotor speed of the doubly fed induction generator uh, as a function of the wind speed to obtain the optimal tip speed ratio. So, as we can see here, the result of this control is here. We, we can obtain uh, the maximal power coefficient here. So, the control of the rotor. So the control of the rotor speed allows increasing the overall efficiency of the turbine. And uh, the last type, the last configuration is type 4. That's a variable speed wind energy conversion system also. And uh, uh, in this system, we use a full capacity, pow full capacity power converter, as we can see here in the configuration. So the power converter here has, has to have the same capacity of the generator. Sometimes the power converter uh, can present even higher capacity than the, the generator. Uh, because all the power, output power of the generator has to pass, oh, has to pass through the power converter here. Uh, the system can use different electrical machines uh, it can use a squirrel cage induction generator, a wound rotor synchronous generator, or a permanent magnet synchronous generator. And uh, uh, the, uh, the generator, that's one uh, great advantage of this configuration, is that the generator can operate in full speed range. So you can get the optimal tip speed ratio uh, for all operation uh, of the generator. The system, the system uh, another advantage is that the system can perform reactive power compensation and smooth the grid connection. As the type 3, we can control the reactive power injected by the generator into the grid or the, or the power factor here in the point of the connection with the grid. And if a low speed synchronous generator that is a generator with a large number of poles is used so the system can operate, with, can operate without a gearbox. So these wind turbines are connected to the power grid use usually in a wind power plant. So uh, the wind turbines are interconnected in a power plant by a collector system which connected them to the point of connection. As we can see here, the point of connection and the wind turbines. Current wind turbines rate, rating uh, range from 1.5 megawatts to 5 megawatts per turbine and generators el generates electrical power at a low voltage level, typically uh, 575 volts or 690 volts. Each wind turbine is connected to a transformer. Here we can see this transformer that steps up the voltage to the medium level, typically 34 kilovolts. And the wind turbines are connected, connected to each other in a string configuration, as we can see here. This is a typical configuration of a wind power plant. And the feeder circuits can be underground cables or overhead line. The most typical is underground cables. These feeders are connected to a substation, as we can see here, uh, a, a substation transformer, which steps up the voltage to a transmission, transmission voltage level that usually is 60 kV or above. So as we are connecting wind power plants to the power grid, uh, and it's, uh, it uses a different configuration 
uh, than the conventional ones because the system operators are used uh, to control and to operate generation based on synchronous generator that we can control the frequency by controlling the rotor speed and when I I we can control the voltage by controlling the current of the synchronous generator what uh, which is not possible in the configurations of wind turbines so uh, basically the grid codes are technical requirements to interconnect power plants to the power system and the goal of the grid codes is to ensure safe reliable and economic operation of the power system and as the penetration level of wind power increases the sim system operators have to adapt the requirements for wind power. So the grid codes in, ma in many countries have been updated to address issues related to the wind power, actually related to the increased connection of the wind power in the power systems. The main elements in grid codes related to wind power include fault ride through requirements, frequency support, active and reactive power control, power quality, and system protection. So the first grid code that's a grid code uh, that's very discussed for system operators is the fault ride through requirement. Uh, the fault ride through requirement, it is basically a requirement uh, to the wind turbines not to be disconnected from the system uh, during a fault in the system. So grid disturbance uh, such as severe voltage sags caused by faults can lead to a significant disconnection of wind power units simultaneously and may cause instability in the power system. So as a result, system operators are requiring that wind turbines remain connected during grid faults, allowing the protection system to clear the fault and not to produce an instability in the power system. The depth and duration of the voltage sags are defined by a voltage time diagram. Uh, that's the low voltage ride through requirement. And uh, that's, an, we have two examples of a low voltage ride through requirement. Uh, the first one is from different countries, for example, Italy and Germany. And the second one is the Brazilian uh, vo low voltage ride through requirement. As we can see here, in uh, for the Brazilian requirement, uh, if the voltage, the terminal voltage of the wind, uh, the wind farm is 20% of the nominal voltage, the, the wind farm has to stay connected for at least 500 milliseconds. Uh, so the wind farm only can disconnect it from the system, from the power system, if, the, if there is a voltage, a voltage dip, uh, a voltage sagger, sag lower than 20% of the nominal voltage, or if the voltage sag lasts for more than five, 500 milliseconds. So, uh, the doubly fed induction generator is one of the most, the most sensitive technology for these requirements. And why? Uh, because the power converters here, uh, they are very sensitive to high currents. And these high, cur high currents are going to be induced when we have a voltage variation here on the power system, here on the point of connection. So, uh, a crowbar protection circuit is connected between the rotor circuit and the rotor side converter, as we can see here in the figure. The crowbar protection circuit is composed of three uh, phase bidire bidirectional switches and a bypass resistors. So when we have a short circuit in the power system, the voltage is going to be reduced, and then we are going to activate the crowbar and deactivated the power converters here in the double fed induction generator. But while the crowbar is active, the converter is deactivated and the machine lacks its contro controllability. And while the converters are not activated, the double fed absorbs reactive power from the grid, 
which can lead the system to uh, instability. So how we can analyze this type of phenomenon? Uh, in order to evaluate if uh, the double fed induction generator can influence the system instability, one question that we should respond is, what is the maximal fault clearing time? A way to respond to these questions or to analyze this problem, this issue, we can have the curve of torque, electrical torque of the generator as a function of the rotary speed. Assuming that we are operating in this point, by the time we have a fault in the system, the electrical torque is going to zero, while the mechanical torque remains the same value as here. So during the fault, the rotary speed is going to increase. If when the fault is cleared, for example, uh, following the green line, if the fault is cleared here, uh, we have voltages again on the generator, and the operation point is going to back here. Here, uh, the electrical torque is higher than the mechanical torque applied to the generator. And then the system goes back to the uh, initial operation operating point. But if we follow the red line and the fault is cleared just here, uh, when the fault is cleared here, the electrical torque that's going uh, that we're going to have is lower than the mechanical torque. So the rotor speed is going to keep increasing, and we probably uh, we are going to have an instability point, an instability in the grid. But uh, the voltage that are applied in the rotor circuit by the power converters can modify the electrical, uh, the, the, the electrical torque of the machine, as we can see here in this graph. So by controlling the voltage applied to the rotor circuits applied by the power converters, we can also improve the stability of the system or the stability of the double fed induction generator. So the challenges here is based on this analysis propose different strategies or rotor circuit protection schemes to improve the power system stability. There are a lot of research being done in this top. Another, another important uh, code requirement today uh, is the system inertial is related to the system inertial uh, response for frequency disturbance. Uh, imbalance between power supply and dem dem demand results in frequency variation in the power system. As we can see here, there is an example of frequency variation in the power system. Here we have the frequency nadir represented here. And the first response of the system in the first seconds is based on the system inertial response, as we can see here. After some set some seconds we are going to have the primary control and then after 30 seconds we're going to have the secondary control. And uh, com traditionally uh, who is going to respond to this variation are basically the synchronous generator of the system, the conventional synchronous generators of the system. And here is the behavior of a synchronous generator uh, as due to a variation of frequency. As we can see here, uh, initially, the when there is a variation on frequency of the system, uh, the output power of the synchronous generator is going to increase. And the, frec the rotary speed of the synchronous generator is going to decrease. The dis this disturbance happens because the load the load is higher, the demand is higher than the generation. And this behavior of the synchronous generator uh, improves the frequency response of the system. That is, this behavior, this the inertial behavior, that is the, the behavior in the first seconds, it keeps a frequency, uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't decrease so much the frequency 
nadir here of the system. Uh, basically, what happens? The stored energy compensates for temporary power imbalance after a load sh change. The stored energy in the synchronous generators, in the rotate masses of the synchronous generator. <coughs> so the system inertia response, verbal speed wind turbines, especially doubly fed induction generators, uh, are decoupled by power electronic converters from the power network and do not intrinsically contribute to the power system inertia. The increasing wind penetration level in power systems results in deeper and faster frequency excursions for system disturbance. So several system operators, operators are requiring synthetic inertia from the wind turbines. So basically, the synthetic inertia uh, the wind, wind turbines should release part of their kinetic energy after a frequency disturbance. So uh, for here we have some ex one example of the gri Brazilian grid code about synthetic inertia. In Brazil, the wind power plants above 10 megawatts should emulate inertia, inject injecting 10% of the nominal power for five seconds for under frequency of two, 200 millihertz in a minimum rate of 0 0.8 PU, PU per hertz. So as we can see here, when the frequ here in re the red line is the frequency of the system, when the frequency of the system reaches a variation of 0 0.2 hertz, uh, the wind power should start increasing uh, it output power and this increase should be 10% of the nominal power and should last for 5 seconds so here we can see the injecting uh, the wind generator injecting kinetic energy start in the rotating mass but what's going to happen when the uh, wind turbine is injecting uh, more power into the system, that it's nominal power. Its rotor speed is going to decrease because it is injecting it kinet its kinetic energy. So after that, he, uh, the turbine has to recover the energy released to the system and has to absorb power from the system. So uh, basically, in the wind, uh, in, in the wind generator, a control signal proportional to the frequency variation is added to the torque control of the wind turbine. So here we have the conventional torque control of the wind turbine that, uh, 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 that is based on the maximum power point tracking. And then we have to add an, uh, another control that is proportional over to the variation of the frequency of the system. And, this, and because of this control, there is another, another signal of torque, uh, of, the re of reference torque to the turbine. So what are the questions and challenges related to this topic? Uh, basically, they are trying to respond. What is the minimum inertia requirement for system frequencies to, to keep the, fre uh, the frequency stability of the system? Are there better strategies to control the synthetic in inertia? There are a lot of work on this topic. And what is the best moment to the turbine recover the kinetic energy? Because as we, as we see here, here he is uh, recovering uh, its kinetic energy. But the question, uh, the question is, the system has already recovered because this kinetic energy is being absorbed from the power system. And another top is the reactive power control. Variable speed wind turbines, type 3 and 4, that are currently the most used, uh, can control the reactive power. U usually, they operate at unitary power factor, but today, the grid codes are requiring that wind turbines contrib contribute with reactive power to the system. So 
Uh, for example, this is the, uh, the requirement of the Brazilian grid code. So uh, wind farms, wind power or wind power plants in Brazil have to be, uh, ha has to be able to operate in a variation of the power factor from uh, 0.95 capacitive to 0.95 inductive. But why are the challenges of this kind of control. The control of reactive power support for wind generation is challenging uh, because one of the questions here is the design of the collector system may limit their reactive power output. The other one is that for the double fed induction generator, the reactive power compensation depends on the operating point, which depends on the wind speed. So. Uh, these characteristics should be considered when we are operating a wind turbine, in, uh, a wind generator, in different uh, uh, power factors. So as final considerations here, uh, currently, since the penetration level of wind power in the power system is increasing, the system operators are requiring that wind power plants contribute to ancillary uh, services as frequency and reactive power control. But the configuration of a wind generator does not allow the same controls as the ones of synchronous generators that the systems operators are used to. So the system operators and generator manufacturers are developing sol solutions for operating a power system with high penetration of wind power. That's the big challenge of the future. So there are several challenges to be solved in this field. And here just showing the opportunities in this field here. Uh, we, uh, Federal University of ABC. I am a professor at this university. Uh, here is the website of the uh, university. Uh, uh, UFABC is located in the region now as ABC in the metropolitania area of Sao Paulo. Uh, we have two graduate programs that uh, presents this uh, research top. Uh, the first one is the uh, graduate program of energy. It's an interdisciplinary program focusing in areas such as planning, policy, education, design, and use of energy in complex systems. Here is the website. Uh, next call for application in September 2000 this of this year. Uh, the second one is the graduate program of electrical engineering, also in Federal University of ABC. The program includes the following research lines, electrical and electronic systems, and computational modeling and simulation. Here is the website. Uh, there is also opportunities here at USP, at the Laboratório de Redes Elétricas Avançadas, or Advanced Power Grid Lab, uh, at the graduate program in electrical engineering da Escola Politécnica da Universidade de São Paulo. This is the website of this program. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Laura. Um, why would you need to uh, contribute, contribute with reactive power to the grid? Okay, because we have to keep the voltage stability in the grid. And the voltage is related to the, power, the reactive power of the system. So in a lot of situations, the wind farms are very f in a point very far from the main power systems. And to operate uh, and to keep maintain the voltage at this point of the systems, you need to inject reactive power. So that's why, uh, so we have so much uh, wind power plants, so many wind power plants connected to the system. And these wind power plants have to contribute uh, with reactive power. Otherwise, we can have uh, voltage instability in the system. The voltage can, can be too low. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rafael from, from Unicamp, and I work with solar. Uh, I have a question regarding the high penetration levels of wind power in northeastern Brazil. 
Uh, how does the operator work nowadays with this? Related to any specific grid of the grid codes? Uh, d does it? Does he control the the voltage? The, the yes. Uh, nowadays in Brazil, the is there like reg regulation? Is it well developed? Yes. Uh, the system operator in Brazil it requires actually for uh, a, a a during the day it requires different reactive power from the wind power plants and the wind power plants has to respond them has to control the the reactive power output as they require otherwise they are going to to pay for it Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have more like a general question. Do you think it is possible to have an energy system that comprises only wind turbines and some energy storage to be 100%? Because normally today we have some conventional generators and in case of frequency drop, we switch them on off. Yes, I believe it. <laughs> but we have to improve the controls used in the wind turbines and the wind power plants to do this. For example, uh, if we have 100% of, uh, of the system with wind power, we, have, uh, we need more reserve. So we can't operate all wind turbines in the maximum power point. We have to operate them below the maximum power point and we when we have to increase the output power, so we are going to have a reserve to increase the output power of the generator. Uh, my answer is yes, but we have a lot of, to of work to make to enable this uh, situation. Thank you. Congratulations uh, for your presentation. My name is Ulysses. Is I, I have an, um, one doubt in, in your slide that you said uh, about the uh, the turbine has uh, the turbine reaches 0 0.8 pu per hertz, and uh, I, I I don't know, but I think the Yes. Yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, um. But uh, in the the regulation of the Brazilian regulation, I think is zero point ninety two, and uh, I I don't know if it's correct, but uh, I think we we will have problem about this uh, if the time is very very high. Actually, this is the rate that this variation of 10% of the nominal power has to come from 0 to 10%. So uh, that's the ratio uh, is 80% uh, of nominal power per 1 hertz. But we, ju we don't have 1 hertz here. We have only uh, 200 millihertz of variation. Not sure if... Did I answer it? No, okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I am André from Rio Grande do Sul. And see, I'm a mechanical engineer, so a lot of stuff to, to try to understand. Um, I actually I use a uh, high-speed permanent magnet generator in one of my applications. Uh, we can do some applications that could reach something around 500 kilowatts. It's not the, the size of a wind farm, uh, farm uh, power plant. And I will have to ask to you, uh, do I have to worry? about this kind of stability? Can I, can I as, um, see, I can, I put it in the grid, 
but it's not that I am a power plant. I am more a cogenerator tune system. So should I be worried about it? Because actually what I did is I generated the AC, translated to DC, frequency inverter, power. Okay. These requirements are, are for transmission system operators. So I think that your turbine is connected to the distribution systems. So you have to uh, look for the requirements of the distribution company, the utility company in this case. And each utility company in Brazil presents different requirements for wind power. So because it's a, 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 a medium scale uh, wind generator in this case, not a wind power plant. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Abel. Before I introduce Dr. Catherine, I'd like to ask, where is the list? OK. So you make it run this way, OK? So the last guy will take it in hands will be I. OK? So now we are going to close with a golden key lecture. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Catherine Dykes from RL Laboratories. Oh, she, she, she graduated at Pennsylvania University, with, got a bachelor in electrical engineering, took a, a master, and she took her PhD in M at MIT some years ago, and she is very, very skilled in wind farm optimization and lots of other subjects. So maybe we stay here for many hours and very interested in her lecture. Thank you, Catherine. It's all yours. All right, so I am the last speaker of a whole week of lectures, very last one. And I know you guys are probably very tired. I know after a day long of conference, I get tired of listening to talk after talk after talk. It gets exhausting. So we're going to stretch a little. Um, has anyone here done the wind turbine dance? No? Well, you're about to. So everybody stand up. We got to exercise. I got to get your brains active again. You know, there's lunch and you're tired. You got to get going, all right? So. All right, everyone's up. So Dr. Jen Gaud gave a fabulous talk this morning about all the uh, dynamic behavior of wind turbines. So um, you see me, I'm standing up on a turbine there. That's at our NREL wind site. It's 80 meters up in the air. And um, even in, uh, without operation, you can feel the movement standing on the tower, right? Turbines are constantly moving, even when they're off, because the winds are very strong at that height. And these are very tall, slender structures, both the blades and the towers. So you know you've got the flat moment of the blade, so everyone work your arms a little here, right? This is a blade flat moment out of plane, right? Then you've got the edgewise moment, up and down, edgewise moment, tower fore aft, tower fore aft, bending, tower side side, tower side side. Now you put them all together. Everybody do the wind turbine dance. Everybody around. Yeah, and spin your arms. Loosen up. All right. Great. Now, anytime you guys need a break in the office, you go back, you get your colleagues, everybody stand up. You can teach them how to do it. We'll spread it around the world, all right? Okay. All right. Okay, you guys are done for the day. We can go home. Just kidding. We got a few more hours. Uh, but yeah, wind turbines are awesome. I love working on wind energy. I've been doing it for over 10 years now, starting in grad school. And now I've been at NREL for uh, almost eight years now working in wind energy research, and I'm very passionate about the field. So this is going to be a lot more fun for you guys and a lot more fun for me if you guys ask questions throughout. So any questions that come to mind, just raise your hand, shout it out. Let's have you know, a little bit of a dialogue, a little bit of discussion as we're going through. Um, so I'm going to start just telling you a little bit about NREL before I move on to the actual content of my talk. So this is where I work. This is in uh, Colorado in the United States. You can see the lovely Rocky Mountains behind us. 
Um, that's, uh, that's where I go to work every day. We have uh, several wind test turbines at our facility, um, some utility scale ones. You can see a Siemens Gamesa one on the far left there, a 2.3 megawatt turbine. Uh, we have a GE 1.5 megawatt turbine in the far right. Uh, I do actually, I run some experiments myself on that turbine, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have an Alstom, now part of GE, three megawatt turbine as well. And then in the center are probably our most interesting turbines. Those are our controls advanced research turbines. So those are old Westinghouse turbines from the 1980s. And uh, we basically hauled them from a wind site to our site and we've completely outfitted them with all these controls and sensors. So we can do very, very detailed characterization of the loads and the controls and do all sorts of controls research on those turbines. So it's a lot of fun. We also have component test facilities for the blades and the drivetrain. Um, and we've been there since the late 70s. So NREL was one of the first organizations in the world to um, start to do and continuously do research in renewable energy. So um, we're a national laboratory in the US. We have about 2,500 employees. And all of us focus exclusively on renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and so it's a really exciting place to work. These are some of our component test facilities, just so you guys can see. That's actually a blade test, so what you guys were just doing now, that's what we do to the blades, you know, in the, uh, in the uh, test facility. We hook them up and we do both extreme load and fatigue testing. We also have a drivetrain testing facility where we can um, test drivetrains up to five megawatts in size. And we have what's called a controllable grid interface, which is really cool because what it does is decouple our test facility from the utility. So we can test all those sorts of things that Ada just spoke about, like frequency uh, changes to the grid and uh, you know, having a phase, uh, losing a single phase or a three phase fault, all these sorts of grid faults that the turbines have to experience in the field, we can actually impose those in our system and test them on the turbines. So um, a lot of neat test facilities. So that's NREL. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background about our, our overall organization before I start. And here's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna try to do the first topic uh, before the break, um, and we'll see how that goes. And then after the break, um, I'm gonna go through the rest of them. Uh, with time, the last one, I don't know. We'll see how I have. I, but all the slides, you guys will have the PDF of them, so if we don't make it through all the content, I'm not gonna keep you here really late, I, I promise. Um, so for the first part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the past and the future of wind. So I'm gonna revisit a little bit more of the history of wind energy innovation, where it's come from, and speak to where we at NREL think wind energy is going in the future. Then I'm going to talk about how we design plants today. So I'm gonna go through kind of what is a typical wind plant design process and how do we do wind plant optimization. I'll talk a little bit about the research we're doing on optimization in wind energy systems at NREL. And then I'll show you some software that's open source that you guys can download and play with tomorrow or today um, to actually do things like optimization of wind plant controls. And then with time, I'll show you some advanced work that we're doing in the field as well. So I'll start with the past, present, and future of wind energy, focusing on innovation and wind energy technology. So the first wind energy systems, I'm going all the way back. Um, just as a little bit of a you know, reminder that wind energy has been in the world as, as long as you know, we've had really civilization around, back to ancient times. And uh, some of the first mills uh, were in vertical axis mills, so spinning around the vertical axis in ancient Persia, uh, now Iran. And um, uh, you could see them uh, used for milling grain and all sorts of things. Uh, the second type of mill we started to see was in the Middle Ages, uh, mostly in kind of northern western Europe where the horizontal post or tower mills. You can see one here. And how many of you have actually seen a windmill like this in real life? Uh, often they're still in operation today in some places. They use them for milling grains and all sorts of different things. So a lot of you have seen these types of mills. And then probably even more of you, well, many of you have probably seen these types of mills, these windrows types mills, which uh, came up in the uh, late sort of uh, 19th century, really important in, uh, in uh, basically all of the Americas in terms of uh, providing irrigation resources. So how many of you have seen this type of mill? Okay, yeah, uh, like I'd say the majority of, uh, of you folks in the room. So we've had windmills around forever. And, you know, they were a prominent source of energy generation up until electricity was introduced in the middle of the 19th century and started to grow and grow more towards the end of the 19th century and, of course, in the 20th century. 
But even with the first advent of using uh, um, electricity generation for our, our, you know, kind of as a, a substitution for prime mover for a lot of applications and energy supply, people were already thinking about using wind to drive electric generators. So the first patent that we know of about wind technology um, being used to drive a generator actually comes from around uh, the middle of the 19th century. So I think it's around 1841 or so uh, by a Belgian fellow. Um, there, of course, weren't any attempts that we know of practically to do this, but in 1888, Charles Brush, who was an inventor in the United States, and um, actually introduced some very interesting generator designs and, and systems in uh, Ohio, developed a relatively large-scale electric generator system for his lab. How many of you have actually heard of Charles Brush and his wind dynamo? Okay, one person, two people. All right. So it was, as you can see, a 17-meter diameter thing. So you can't really see too well, but there's a person right there. So that's a person standing next to this mill. So that gives you an idea of the scale that that was at the time. Huge, huge machine based on the windrow style because it has those many blades, has a little passive yaw system, and uh, actually powered a 12 kilowatt generator that powered his lab facilities for about a decade. Um, so, you know, a very uh, excellent in, uh, introduction of electricity generated by wind. Um, several other companies started to do this at the end of the 19th century, introducing uh, with small-scale wind, uh, windmills, electric charging systems that you could use in the rural countryside. And from about the end of World War I and even before, to through the 1950s, there was a wide uh, dissemination of um, what were called wind dynamos. So basically small windmills, propeller-type windmills with electric generation systems all throughout uh, the world. So hundreds of thousands of these systems were actually built and sold all over the world. So wind energy for electricity generation has been around for quite a while and was actually quite successful um, before rural electrif uh, electrification hit and actually led to a decrease in the use of these because um, one of the big uh, um, limitations for these early systems was that they couldn't be connected to the larger grid systems. So as Ada said, you know, there's compatibility issues with how you operate a standard grid and wind generator technology. These early systems could not be connected to the grid. So when someone connected to the grid, they would typically not use their windmill generator anymore. But there were some attempts to build some of the first large-scale utility connected uh, electric generators in the uh, sort of around the 1940s through 1960s time frame. So has anyone here heard of the Smith Putnam turbine? All right, so that someone here has read a history book on wind energy, I can tell. Um, but only one person, so that's great. So the Smith Put Putnam turbine is right here. It was the first multi-megawatt turbine, and it was not a very well-designed turbine. It did not last that long. Um, it was put up in the, the 1940s time frame. It had steel blades. So these were super heavy blades, um, lots of loads. They were originally meant to be aluminum, but they uh, couldn't get the aluminum supplier to get the blades. So they had steel blades, didn't last very long. A much more successful early example of a large scale uh, wind generator is the Gedzer turbine. Has anyone heard of the Gedzer turbine? Aside from this gentleman over here. Ah, and you haven't, all right. Okay, so the Gedzer turbine, if you guys uh, know any historical turbine, in the world of, of any turbine that was developed in the first half of the 20th century or even through the 1960s, it would be this one. The Gedzer Mill was uh, developed in Denmark by a fellow named Johannes Juhl, and it is basically the uh, grandfather of modern wind technology, especially wind turbines in the 1980s. So this windmill here, which was built in the 1950s timeframe, operated for 20 some years. They brought it back up, had it operating again in the late 1970s, its blade design has influenced modern wind technology going forward. So um, it was the first really successful case of a utility scale grid connected wind turbine. Okay, so from those Danish foundations, I mentioned Yule, he was the inventor of the Gedzer turbine, led to the development of blades that were inspired by the Gedzer turbine and then a host of companies in Denmark that started to implement and use that blade style and essentially had what were very, very similar looking machines. They called them the Danish clones. And you can see now starting to appear some of our modern day companies. So Vestas got into the mix, Siemens, GE, 
And all of these companies can trace their history back to that Gedser turbine and that Danish tradition. Um, so it's a very interesting historic or historical story. So here's the Vestas 55 kilowatt. There were thousands of these that were deployed in the 1980s, you know, which is the advent really of the modern wind era. So thousands of these turbines all across the US, Europe, other places. And uh, you can see that um, they look a lot like the turbines do today, right? Upwind, three bladed, active yaw systems. They're on lattice towers typically. We have monopoles today. Um, they don't have pitch. They were stall controlled uh, back then, but they did have blade tips that pitched actually to break the, do aerodynamic braking in the systems. But very similar looking to our turbines today. So setting a standard going forward. Um, compare that to a modern day Vestas turbine. This is state of the art. This is uh, kind of the latest commercial product to come out from Vestas. 150, so that's 150 meter rotor diameter, 4.2 megawatt system for land-based applications, not for offshore, but for land. So that's almost 100 times more power today that we're producing out of a single turbine. So a really impressive feat in story and scaling of the technology over time. Does anyone have any questions about the history of wind? And can we yell? I don't know if yelling will work, but. Uh, hello, my name is Gustavo. I, I'm just wondering what was the reason to change from lattice towers to monopile towers, for example? And if we could consider actually the uh, lattice tower also for the curate uh, projects. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, a lot of the older machines, the smaller ones, you did see lattice towers. Lattice towers um, are, they're, the difficulty actually comes in all the bolts and the interconnections and the need to maintain those bolts. Um, that's one of the big disadvantages. Um, and uh, they also tend to be a lot stiffer than um, your monopoles, which you can develop in a soft, soft configuration. And frequency constraints have a big effect on overall system design. So. There's a few different considerations as to why you know, we've shifted away from the lattice type towers to the monopoles. We're seeing some people investigate lattice towers for going to very, very high heights um, because you know, just with the design of things, um, it's, it makes you know, potentially more sense to look at lattice towers for going to very, very high heights to reduce the overall mass of, uh, of these towers, which are the most massive component of the overall system. Um, there's a company in Spain called Nabroen that has a very interesting sort of space frame lattice tower concept for tall towers on land. And then we also saw from Jen uh, Gao earlier today that for, um, uh, for uh, some offshore applications, there's some investigation of uh, lattice towers as well. Anything else on the history? All right, let's move forward then to present day. So here's where we are today. Um, Global Wind Energy Council uh, looks at the overall installed capacity for wind globally around the world. So you can see, I think that's 2017, that's a little fuzzy, uh, but we have uh, over half a terawatt of uh, wind capacity installed worldwide at this point. So a huge amount of, uh, of wind installed uh, internationally. Um, very exciting and along with that we've seen the cost decline quite substantially over the years. So you can see here um, you know, here's the exponential sort of growth in uh, capacity that we've seen over time, corresponding with a exponential sort of decline in the cost of energy for wind. And so Eric Larson talked yesterday about learning curves and things like that. You can see um, very clearly that as we've had more and more wind deployed, we've also seen an exponential decrease in costs over time. So some key attributes of modern wind energy areas. So like again, starting from 1980s to current day, um, several aspects of uh, that innovation that drove us down to that LCOE uh, that we see today of being really, really low. So innovation through learning, learning curves, right? Learning with the technology. We talked about that yesterday with Eric Larson. Industrialization, getting economies of scale through mass producing and making many, many, many of these turbines over time. A huge aspect of it has been uh, turbine scaling. So a lot of people have talked about the continuous scaling we've seen in the technology over time. And that's led to economies of scale as well. Um, you reduce your infrastructure costs, your overall cost per kilowatt, and uh, you get uh, a better overall cost of energy. And then standards and R&D based innovation. So I talked before about how the technology very early on became sort of standardized in a certain platform. And as development continued of scaling up that platform, 
you were able to establish standards that help to reduce costs. And then also R&D based innovation. There's been a lot of investment as the industry has matured into the technology and improving wind technology. So all of this though, I would say, I would argue, has been primarily focused for the last several decades on the turbine itself. So most of the innovation that we've seen and most of what has driven the cost of energy for wind energy decreasing has been turbine level innovation. So innovation on the blades, the towers, the drivetrains, et cetera. So here's another picture of the turbine scaling and a little bit more on you know, how we got to where we are. So we had a lot of failures in the early days. So there were a lot of uh, um, blade failures, tower failures, blade tower strikes. Um, you know, just a lot of bad things happen when we try to deploy these in mass scale, thousands of them at a time, without a lot of experience in the field. So that drove to a lot of testing. So there was a lot of testing sort of starting around the late 80s to 90s time frame to try and understand why things were breaking, understand better the wind physics. That led to the development of codes. So uh, uh, again, Dr. Gao presented to us a number of uh, simulation codes that are used to analyze the dynamics of wind turbines. These are very important to ensure the, the integrity and survivability of the designs. That then led to establishment of design processes, formal design processes for the technology. And finally, standards. And so all modern wind turbines now are developed to these standards. And so embodied in, in these standards is sort of the criteria that will ensure that these turbines are able to withstand the harshest environments without breaking down and having failures. On the R&D innovation side, we've done a number of things over the last several decades. Again, really focused on the turbine. And here I'm going to pick on blades because they really are, of course, the heart of the machine. They are the prime mover that provides the torque for the generator. Um, so we've done a lot for blades in terms of innovation over time. So on the bottom, you can see this is what a blade, that sort of Gedzer inspired blade looked like from the early 1980s. You can see it's pretty, it has a pretty thick solidity, you know, pretty large cord. Um, and, uh, you know, compare that to the other one, there's like, you know, little twist and uh, the sweep and the coning. So all these different features started to appear in blades over time. And we did a number of things in the R&D space to make that happen. So um, airfoils, so the early airfoils that were used in wind turbine technology basically came from aerospace. They were mostly the NACA airfoils and other airfoils that came from the aerospace community. There was a lot of research that's been done over the last several decades to design airfoils specifically for wind energy application and airfoil families specifically for wind energy applications. Um, this allowed, this in particular allowed us to do things with the solidity um, as well as changing the internal structure. That also helped us affect the solidity. Moving from box bar type setups to shear webs, um, using smarter materials and how we use those materials in the manufacturing process allowed us to take a lot of weight out of the blade, make it slender, but also make it stronger at the same time. Adding things like aerostructural coupling. You'll see that in uh, Siemens blades today and others where there's actually bend twist coupling. So there's coupling between the aerodynamics and the structural dynamics that's built into the blades passively. Um, Add-ons that are added to the blades to help them perform better um, in a myriad of different ways. There's so many different types of add-ons you can use and the research goes on and on. People are still doing a lot of work looking at how we can make blades better in the future, but there's been a huge amount that's been done in the past leading to a, a really successful technology to date. And what this has done is really allowed us, again, to drive down that LCOE as we've been scaling up the turbine. So if you were just to geometrically scale this guy down here, you know, as you square the area, and we saw before how power from the wind is related to the area times the power coefficient times the density times 1 half times the velocity cube. So you want to make it a bigger turbine to capture more energy bigger area. But as you do that and you scale ge geometrically, you get what's called the square cube law, where your volume goes up by, you know, a cubic power. And so your weight is increasing faster, your cost is increasing faster than the energy capture that you gain from that size increase. Does that make sense? So to do all these innovations is really to beat what we call the square cu cube law. And it's really allowed us to do that in the industry. So what you see in the dots here is the actual industrial data of blade weight with respect to the length of the blade over time. And since you know, size has increased over time, this is sort of chronological plot as well. And what you can see is that if you fit a curve to that, the exponent is going to be much less than three. It's actually closer to two. 
which means we're almost on par in terms of increasing the area of the swept rotor and keeping the volume increasing only about as squared as well, which is really impressive. So that has been achieved, again, by all these types of innovations and more. And so this is, you know, this type of uh, thing is what has led us to um, the gains we've had in cost of energy uh, reductions over time. So that all that together has led to this decrease in LCOE over time. And has made wind energy one of the most competitive electricity generation sources in the world, even without subsidies. So this was a study done by Lazard in 2016, looking at unsubsidized costs of electricity. So they were kind of trying to take the subsidies out of the equation for all energy technologies, because all energy technologies, at least in the US, get some form of subsidy. And doing that really shows that wind, I'm sorry this is fuzzy here, but this is wind, onshore wind right here, is one of the most, if not the most, competitive electricity uh, generation resource unsubsidized uh, for a range of different resource conditions. All right, and so this again has been what has led us to develop uh, a wind industry that's deployed over half a terawatt of installed capacity um, sin since the end of 2017. All right, so that is where we are today. Um, but to remain competitive, we have a lot of sort of uh, um, factors that we need to focus on. So firstly, uh, we have the uh, gas prices. Gas prices, as you go, natural gas prices have been really low for the last several years. And so, you know, that's of course uh, competition uh, for electricity generation with everything else and with wind as well. We've also seen a huge decline in uh, PV technology. Um, and so PV at utility scale is almost on par with wind. And so there's a lot of debate going on right now as to whether wind or solar will be the cheapest electricity resource in the world. Now, you know, from my perspective, we're going to have a whole lot of both in the future. So hopefully both will be really cheap. Uh, but it is uh, something that the wind industry is concerned with. They want to, of course, make sure that they are profitable going forward and want to have a very low cost energy. So we still want to be able to drive down that LCOE going forward, keep that learning curve going so we can see continued costs of energy drop. And to do that, we need more innovation. So wind energy can't rest on its laurels. We can't stop with where we are today. We need to innovate to compete going forward and, and hopefully become an even higher and greater uh, resource for the overall electricity and energy system. Okay, so I'm going to move from here to the future, but before I do, does anyone have any comments or questions about current energy paradigm for wind? Yeah? Thank you. Um, I was quite surprised to see in the previous slide that the LCOE for the wind is uh, actually lower for the than for the PV, because normally in all these graphs, uh, the price for the PV is much lower than for the wind. And I was wondering how comes. Is this on now? Yeah. Okay. And where is the PV in this graph? Yeah. To, to so see how. So this how was far 2016, I right? So that was a bit over a year ago. So when they did analysis, was before that. And PV has been dropping a lot in the last year or so. Um, so here's wind. Ah, mm -hmm. this is really fuzzy. I'm sorry. Okay. Solar PV is up here. Here we go. And that's, I'm, this is going to be utility, no, wait. Unfortunately, okay. I can't really tell. Yeah, no, it's fine. I think, I <laughs> think um, one of these three is solar PV. Okay, yeah. And, um, and the study is a year or so old. Um, and it also depends greatly, of course, on the resource. So it depends on where you're located. Um, in the US and many places, wind is uh, cheaper for where the wind resource is, and then in some regions, solar is cheaper. Depends on where you are. So southwest, solar is cheaper. In the interior region, wind is cheaper. And so there's a bunch of factors that play into it. But yeah, that's if you were to look at them, they would overlap based on the resource in a particular region, right? So mm -hmm. in sunnier, you know, higher solar radiance areas, solar is probably cheaper now. But in windier, less sunny areas, wind will be cheaper still. <laughs> Makes sense. There was Thank another you. question there. Hi, Professor. I am Ander from Brazil. And just for curiosity, when you say to reduce the cost of electricity available, like 
I have experience in studying like thermal power plants, and we do like the same. We want to reduce the specific cost, dollar per kilowatt, and to do that, we must to increase the production power and decrease the whole entire plant power cost. So, do you have any kind of e equation, economical modeling, to try to estimate the purchase cost and what is the capital installation cost? That you know, because according to the literature for thermal power plants, we use like 3.8 as a, a coefficient installation cost. So, are these are something like similar for wind power plants? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I have slides that actually have our latest sort of cost data, but we put out a report every year on the cost of wind energy, which breaks down the capital costs, operations costs, energy production for a typical plant in the US. Off the top of my head, all in sort of capital expenditures, which include some contingency costs, balance of plan, all those sorts of things, around $1,600 per kilowatt. And then AEP capacity factors now, I think are around, say, 40% or so. The overall LCOE under those analyses falls out to be around, I want to say around six cents for the latest, but I don't have that in this specific presentation, but I can point you to, um, it's the cost of energy review. We put it out every year, and so every year we update the numbers with sort of the latest trends in wind energy costs. Um, and also the IEA Wind uh, Group puts out a cost of wind energy looking more internationally every year. And they sort of uh, highlight what different countries have as their cost for wind power every year. And, uh, I don't know, but you know, in terms of power plants, you ha we have like uh, an equation modeling. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, for example, we have a cost reference that we multiply for some parameter, maybe the, for example, a heat transfer exchange, a heat exchange. We have the area. So we can use that as a parameter to try to, ma to estimate the purchase cost. A wind turbine, what is most important? The power production, the contact area between the blades and the wind, or the flow that's passing through the turbine? OK. Yeah, so how do you kind of like four different sizes of turbines and things El estimate like an LCOE? Yeah. yeah, so typically for what we do there is um, you have like a rated power for the turbine, and you have, um, you know, if you don't have a power curve, then you sort of estimate a power curve using a simple sort of analytical equation, and then you multiply that by a wind resource distribution. So you can sort of, if you just want to guess and say your, you know, typical plant has around a 40% capacity factor, which isn't a bad estimate, somewhere between 40 and 50% for a relatively low specific power machine, then you can just multiply that you know, by the hours in a year to, to get your sort of kilowatt hours per year per times the kilowatt rating. Um, but if you don't have that, then you can use a simple sort of function then to calculate what your AEP would be for a different turbine size. So, and we can talk more about that after if you'd like to talk more. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, what time is it now? Just checking. Clock check. Three twenty-two. Okay, I have till about three forty-five. Three forty-five. Um, okay, so that's sort of looking backwards and where we are today. Um, but as we mentioned, you know, solar is getting cheaper, gas is competitive, and so for the wind industry to do well in the future um, and and be a significant part of the electricity system in the future we need to still be uh, driving down costs. We need to be cost competitive with other electricity generation sources, hopefully unsubsidized. And we also need to start providing more value to the grid. So Ada talked about ancillary services that we need wind to provide to the grid, um, a predictable and controllable energy supply, right? Because wind is varying constantly. So can we get it to be more like a traditional plant where we can control it and have it be predictable? Um, that I'm not going to really touch on today. I'm going to talk mostly about the cost competitive side. Um, so if anyone wants to talk to me after, um, they are welcome to. And there's some slides at the end around uh, the beyond sort of cost competitive uh, view of wind. Um, and wind can do this. We believe wind can do this. But we need a lot of research in the area to realize the full potential of wind energy going forward. All right, so we talked uh, quite a bit in the morning 
about the dynamics involved with wind energy systems. Here's our floating system with all of the uh, complex physics and uh, couplings and across the system in terms of the inflow, the waves, aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, structural dynamics, controls, all these things interacting together. Incredibly complex system. Very hard to design, very hard to understand, operate. Very, very complex system. Um, but we're now going to move to the plant. So from the turbine to the plant, which is what we're going to be focusing on mostly for the rest of the afternoon. So the plant is a collection of co-located turbines that also have a coupled electrical infrastructure. So here's an example of one large-scale offshore wind plant off the coast of Europe. This is the Anholt uh, wind farm. And you can see here the layout of the plant. It's relatively interesting. You can see there's sort of a perimeter to it and some plants on uh, some turbines on the interior. Um, what you can see sort of here, but it's a little fuzzy, is the electrical infrastructure. So for every sort of layout that you might do for the plant in terms of how you place the turbines together, you're going to have to also design the electrical infrastructure that interconnects them, and you have to optimize that as well. And then there's a cable that actually brings the electricity from the plant all the way to shore, or if it's onshore, across the land to where the nearest transmission interconnect would be. So a lot of, uh, of uh, large-scale plants will have their own electrical substations. Sometimes for a very, very large-scale offshore plant, you'll have two offshore electrical substations per plant. So very, very large systems um, of plants, uh, of turbines co-located together with the electrical infrastructure pro providing electricity uh, to the grid. Um, so beyond all the coupling of the physics, we talked about the turbine level. Now we have to worry about the interaction of turbines with their wakes. So the flow within a plant. So I don't know, maybe you guys, how many of you have seen this image before? It's a pretty famous ener uh, wind energy photo. And what it's showing is, uh, you know, um, I think we've talked about the concept of a wind turbine wake before, but how many people, when I say wind turbine wake, know exactly what that means? All right, so a wind turbine wake is essentially low energy flow behind the turbine. So Professor Gao showed the picture of the stream tube, you know, and the derivation of sort of the Betts uh, equation and things like that, where essentially you have this expanded low energy, lower velocity flow behind the rotor. And so if you have a turbine that's here and then one that's like right behind it, the energy that it's going to see from the velocity that's coming at it is less than for the upstream turbine. So it's going to have less energy to, uh, it's going to have less wind of which it can extract energy from. So it's waked by the other turbine. So that's a wind turbine wake is exactly this. It's that area of low energy flow behind turbines because th they've extracted energy from the flow. Go ahead. Can we yell? The, the relatively low efficiency of the wind turbines is because of the limitation of this uh, kind of uh, back flow uh, behind the turbine is called the land the bed's law is it? that it uh, limits the efficiency of the wind turbine up to 70 percent or something like that that applies for every type of, of wind turbine or just for the type that has these rotors in this uh, perpendicular direction we yeah that's generally for something that's extracting flow from a particular you know uh, area yeah of of, uh, of space and you have uh, particular velocity of air going through it. Yeah. Um, and so basically you can think about it like this. You know, if all, if, what would happen if the turbine extracted all the energy going through it? Again? What would happen if the turbine extracted all of the energy uh, that came through it? I will stop, it just is stagnated air. Yeah, it would be stagnated yeah. air, velocity zero. So you really can't have that, right? And so that yeah. whole Betts equation derives the optimum that you could theoretically achieve. And that fluid hydrodynamic limitation is for any kind, any form, any shape of the rotors or just for this? It's, it's kind of. Typically, yes, but there are sort of cheats. Right, so there are people that talk about ducted turbines, mm -hmm. and so then they'll calculate like the um, power coefficient with respect to the area of the duct, and okay. what the duct does was create an augmented flow through the rotor, and so they say they can beat the Betts law, but they're really not beating the Betts law. So okay. there's, yeah. The last question is that it limits the proximity of one turbine to another, or it doesn't matter? Because in Switzerland, I remember that when I was traveling train, 
I mean, the one turbine was put here and the next one was like uh, two kilometers far away. So I don't know if it was because they didn't need it to fill up the valley with these wind turbines or because of the stellar. That is a great question because that is exactly the crux of the entire wind plant design process. You have to get the turbines far enough away so that the, en so that the flow has an opportunity to mix again. So after this wake starts to move away from the turbine, it starts to expand and dissipate. And higher energy air mixes with it, so you get more high energy air again. Farther downstream, you get away from that turbine that's up front. And so you want to place the turbines from a wake's perspective as far away as you can from each other, so they each see really high velocity air and can extract a lot of energy. However, what happens when you place turbines really far apart? What costs might go up? Can't hear you guys. Connection. Connection costs, what'd you say? Yeah, the site costs, roads, all the sort of infrastructure costs you have for the plant. You'd like those turbines to be as close together as possible so you as, have as little infrastructure between the turbines, all the electrical cabling, roads, everything else, um, being able to get a crane from one site to other. It'd be nice to put the turbines as close together as you can. Land costs, leasing of the land area, all these things. But it's a balance, right? So in an optimization process, what we're really trying to do is maximize our energy while minimizing our costs to get the overall minimum cost of energy. And we'll get to that more later today. But that's a big primary issue with wind plant design. All right, so that's wakes. Any other questions about wakes? Um, hello. Um, you were just saying about land costs, and I was wondering, uh, how does it work with uh, offshore wind farms? So it depends, of course, on the country and, and place. Um, so for example, in Europe, uh, mostly it's handled by the, the countries have you know, dominion of certain waters that extend off their coasts. And so they'll do leases in those areas that are off their coasts, like the UK, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France. Um, in the US, we have both state waters and national waters. So from a certain distance from shore, the state owns the land, and then beyond that, the federal government does. And so you can have either the state or the federal government leasing the lands. And then, uh, like, the person pays for the government. Is that it? To use the yeah, land? So, yeah, exactly. So the money paid either to the state or the federal government goes to the government, uh, and in most cases, in the UK, it goes to the Crown Estate. Uh, the queen gets a little piece of the action, basically, because she owns the land off the coast, apparently. Um, okay, so other questions? Wind turbine plant flow? One more in the back? No, not, not a hand, just a stretch. Okay. All right, so we've got the, um, on top of this, you know, it's a difficult problem, right? We talked about the wakes, and these wakes are very complex phenomena. Um, you normally can't see them. On land, you re can't really see them, although I've seen them from an airplane before. If you ever fly over a plant under certain conditions, um, because of the condensation, you can actually see wind turbine wakes behind a farm. Um, but they're very hard. Uh, not, you don't normally see them. Uh, but they're very complex structures, and they move about all the time. Uh, very hard to figure out where they are. And so with these plants, not only are they very large, complex systems with a lot of complex coupled diam dynamics, there's also a huge amount of uncertainty associated with these plants because we have very sparse information, a very few sensors relative to the overall size of this plant. So we have uh, lots of sensors on the turbines themselves, but in, in between you don't see anything, right? And so maybe for a plant you'll have one or two of what are these MET towers that are sticking up out of the water, measuring the wind and such, um, but very few of them. And so we have very little data around the whole source of the plant. And we also have a lot of lack of knowledge around the physics of this complex flow in the plant. This is still an open area of research. There's tons of PhD theses in terms of trying to understand the flow around wind turbines and in wind turbine plants. Lots of opportunity for research. And so then how the turbines respond to that, again, lots of open-ended research questions in terms of how the turbines respond in these complex environments in terms of both power production and loans. And um, so you, you know, you'd say, OK, well, we have this high uncertainty, but I'm sure with all these sensors in the turbine, we have a lot of data. Um, how much data do you guys think a typical wind turbine produces in a week? In bytes. Anyone have a guess? Huh? 
Okay, yeah, let's say, let's say we're collecting uh, data at around like say a one hertz rate. Nah, one minute, 10 minutes, still don't wanna guess? Okay, about a terabyte of data. A terabyte of data I've seen an estimate of. And I, you know, don't quote me on that because that's not a hard uh, truth, but I have seen uh, um, uh, data to show it's about a terabyte of data. And we get a lot of data from wind turbines, so they take up a huge amount of data storage. And that's just for a turbine. So if we did have all the data in the world, we'd still have this huge, massive problem of what to do and how to properly analyze all this data, which is another cool area of research with wind. This has to do with how we deal with this data. So wind plants take the turbine complexity and basically multiply it by a factor. So now we're dealing with just a whole other level of complexity and uncertainty. So a lot of opportunity, like I said, for R&D. And that's why we think we can really still drive down the cost of wind energy because there's still much, uh, so much more to go in terms of learning about these systems. So here's a little bit in, uh, another sort of picture of that complexity of wind energy physics. Again, I showed you that picture with all the complex physics involved with the turbine. Then you have to go to the interplant flow. Then we have these mesoscale processes. So all these complex sort of regional weather phenomena that interact with the plant. And these are driven by global climate effects. And all of these couplings of these physics from the upper atmosphere all the way down through and into the plant um, make for a, an extremely complex and difficult to model and understand system. Not only that, we're coupled to this thing called the electric grid, which itself is a little bit complex. So very difficult system to analyze. And so we're doing a lot of research at all of these scales. So we're doing research at the turbine response level, at the interplant flow level, mesoscale level, climate level, and then in the coupling across all of these, and again back to and with the grid system. So a lot of research to do here. It's all about coupling with wind energy. That's what makes it a really cool and interesting and difficult technology. All right, so I mentioned that we were able to get where we are today in terms of cost of energy by really focusing on innovation at the turbine level. For the last several decades, we've done a huge amount of work here, and it's driven us to very low cost wind energy, a multi-billion dollar industry, and a lot of advances in tools specifically for turbine analysis. Hello, my name is Diana. I'm from Colombia. Yeah, I would like to know about about uh, a little bit more about the big data, how make the analysis, which kind of models did you use? Can you just have uh, give an overview about that? Sure. Yeah, and I actually don't really have much on big data in my presentation, so I'm glad to talk about it now. Um, this is an area of burgeoning research in wind energy right now. So again, if you're looking for a research topic for graduate research data science for wind energy applications is an open field. We have huge amounts of data and there's been very little done with it to date. Um, typical processes uh, by owner operators to do like, you know, use the data to try and understand like failure rates and things like that is very rudimentary. So there's a huge opportunity for using machine learning, um, AI, uh, you know, all these different, you know, uh, mathematical techniques to dig into and understand wind energy uh, problems. And I think where wind energy, a lot of the opportunity is, is actually coupling the data science with the physical modeling and what we call data assimilation. So how can we not replace the physical models with data science models? How can we augment the physical models with data science? And so this is a huge area of research that's just starting to take off. You're seeing a lot of activity just starting to develop in this space for wind energy. So thank you. Does that answer your question well enough? More or less? Okay, we can talk later too. All right, so going forward, what we really want to look at is optimizing the wind plant. So research at the wind plant level. New technologies that help us um, increase, or sorry, increase energy capture, decrease costs, but looking from the whole plant perspective. Um, design and operate and control these plants op uh, optimally and understand the whole wind plant physics and science challenges better. So we envision through these research opportunities um, that will create the smart wind power plant to the future. Um, we're gonna use high fidelity tools to enhance our resource estimation for the plants and our forecasting to provide more predictable energy to the grid. We're going to have innovative wind turbine uh, technology. So we're not done with wind turbines yet, even though we're going to be plant focused. 
Um, advanced plant control and operational strategies, this is a space that is fairly new altogether to the wind research space, is controlling plants at a, a, a coordinated level of the whole plant level. And uh, providing all sorts of support services to the grid for more controllable and dispatchable energy. So these are our smart plants of the future. It's kind of a, a bad graphic, but you can see the wakes here being directed in certain ways for optimal uh, energy production, sensing techniques, data streams, data science, all sort of coming together. So I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn. So here is an example of a high fidelity simulation of a wind plant. So you can see the little wind turbines here. This is an actual plant in Iowa, in the United States, where we have data and we're simulating it. And what you can see here, this is the blade uh, root, or yeah, blade root flap moment, so that out of plane moment, the load. And so what you can see is this wake is changing and redirecting. And I should restart it so you can see it a little bit better. Let me see if I can do that. Let me try that again. OK. All right, so what you can see right here, you see this turbine here. And this turbine behind it is being waked. And so it sees lesser energy flow that's hitting it because this upstream uh, turbine is stealing its energy. Now the wind's starting to change, and that wake is moving now more to the left. And what you see is higher energy flow is starting to hit that rotor. And as it does, the blade root flap moment for that turbine starts to increase. So the loading that that turbine is seeing because it's seeing higher winds is increasing. And so this way is we can start to understand the dynamics between the wake flow in the park and the loads that the turbine sees and the overall reliability and power production of the machines. So this is the type of thing we're starting to do now, using high fidelity simulations to really try to understand the dynamics of the plant um, at the full plant level. And these are very, very costly simulations. You run them on a supercomputer, et cetera. But they provide you a lot of insight into the physics that are going on in a wind park. All right, so I mentioned high performance computing, data science being a huge boon to uh, the wind community. Another revolution we've seen in terms of enabling technology in the last 10 years is around sensing equipment. So traditional sensing equipment for a wind turbine included some MET towers, meteorological towers that are uh, in the park, like this one right here. This is actually the one from our site um, in Colorado. And it's going to be instrumented with some equipment. So how many people know what an anemometer is? Good, excellent. And a wind vane? So these actually you know, measure your wind speed and direction over time. There are different variants of them. Um, but basically, they give you a point measurement, right? It's giving you a measurement at that particular location. What we're moving towards more now is advanced remote sensing technologies. These have come a long way in the last 10 years. And what they give you is a profile, not just one point, but a profile of the wind resource over time and space. And so basically, they either send sound beams or light beams into space those bounce off of particles in the atmosphere, come back, and then through a mathematical analysis, they can characterize the wind, uh, the wind behavior over a profile. Um, so how many people have heard of SODARs and LIDARs? Smaller number. But these, these uh, pieces of equipment are, are becoming much more heavily utilized, and they allow you to, like I said, calculate not just a single point of uh, information about the wind, but a whole profile of information. So they do that vertically. So you can calculate and understand the shear and the shear behavior uh, in a certain area. Or you can look at them horizontally. So here's one of the more advanced systems that is out there today. This is a scanning LIDAR. And so it's looking ahead of a turbine. Or sorry, no, this one's looking behind the turbine. It's mounted on the back of it. And what it's doing is actually providing you a, like a resolution in space in a plane at different locations out in front. So a whole volumetric characterization of the wind and how that wake behind the turbine is performing. So this is the low energy flow behind the turbine. You can see it's moving around over time. And so through this type of equipment, we're now for the first time actually able to see wakes behind a turbine and then better, better understand the physics associated with them. And by better understanding the physics associated with them, we can then move on to actually controlling them. So let's see if this starts. Here's another sort of example of, this is in a simulation tool, a LIDAR uh, that's used to characterize the wake behind a turbine. All right, so that's the LIDAR, so it's pointing horizontally in space at a particular point in uh, a plane. 
And what you can see here on the left is this is the simulated LIDAR scan path. So the LIDAR is measuring different points in that 2D plane over time. So you can see it's tracing it out. And as it does, it's filling in more statistical information about that wake behind the turbine. This is if we were just to sample the simulation directly. And this is what we can see with the LIDAR scan path. So we can understand what type of information we're going to get from the LIDAR. And then we can test that in the field. This is what that would crosscut would look like if we take all the complex flow information and look at it over time. So really advanced sensing technology, high performance computing technology, data science, we're bringing all these things together to enhance wind energy technology looking forward. We're also making turbines bigger. I want to check time real quick. What, I'll just keep going a little bit. How many, what time is it now? Is it 3.40? Uh, let me give me a couple more minutes. What time is it? Okay. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit further, finish up this future energy section, and then we'll uh, we'll take a break. All right. So improving performance, capacity, higher heights, larger blades, larger generators. We're still getting turbines to go bigger. Um, we're also increasing the capacity factor. So that's the percentage of energy that the turbine's capturing over the course of the year. So these strings are growing over time. Here's the past trends, and we see these projecting out forward. So Here's the Halide X 12 megawatt. I'm not sure um, if we spoke to the specifics earlier, but it is a, uh, I think it's a 260 meter rotor diameter. So this is over a 100 meter blade. Um, you can see the machine almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. And this is not just a concept. GE has introduced this machine and is planning to build it in the early 2020 to mid 2020 timeframe. So Turbines are getting much, much larger. Um, we're expecting to see them grow uh, over the course of the next decades. And that'll help drive down LCOE. The other thing that we're doing now that we have all this information on wind turbines is doing coordinated control in the plant. So whereas every turbine in the past used to try and capture as much of the energy as it could, leaving as little energy behind it as possible for the rest of the machines, now we're trying to coordinate so that if we optimize the plant controls at the whole plant level, the entire plant energy is higher. So we do this with yaw control, right? So yaw is the motion around your vertical axis here. You can do it with axial induction, which you can do with uh, controlled uh, uh, torque, um, either through pitch control or through uh, commanded torque, um, or tilt control, which is the pivoting forward. And so that's more for downwind machines, which there are not a lot of, but there's potentially um, a lot of power increase available there if we move that direction. So here's an example of how we can increase power with the uh, yaw control. So on the left are two turbines, and these turbines want to face right into the wind. That's the way the turbines traditionally do it. If they detect the wind coming from this direction, they turn towards it so they can capture as much energy as possible. On the right here, the turbine in front is steering a little bit out of the wind. And it loses a little bit of power because it's not facing directly into the wind. But that means its wake is getting steered away from the downstream turbine. And then the downstream turbine is actually capturing more power. And so what happens is the total power from the plant actually increases. And so if we optimize the yaw control setting of every turbine in the farm, we can potentially increase the power for certain directions, 10 plus percent to 20 percent depending on the direction in the farm. So there's a lot of potential if we understand the physics better at the plant level of increasing power output, reducing loads, and reducing cost of energy. Not only that, by being able to control the turbines better and understanding the whole plant physics better, we can start to, preserve, uh, we can start to provide more reliable services to the grid. So here's an example of an integrated simulation of a CFD simulation of a plant with a grid simulation tool so that we can look at the reactive, and, uh, reactive power and voltage control support to the grid and start to understand how we can provide these services more reliably to the grid in the future as we get more wind into the system. So this is a huge area of research going forward, just starting to look at how we can reliably provide all these grid services to the, um, to the system. So that's that area. And by doing all that together, we think we can drive LCOE down by half. So wind is not done. Uh, but we need a lot of innovation and research to do it. So we're far from done. 
Um, so I'm going to skip that slide here and just recap these things, and then we'll break. All right, so through consistent scaling and innovation, we've reached a point where wind energy is cost competitive with most other electricity generation sources in the world. Um, but despite this progress, we have a lot of challenges facing us. We need to still maintain cost competitiveness. We need to use innovation and uh, use 